Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Tony Diaz, El Libro Traficante, author of The Tip of the Pyramid, Cultivating Community Cultural Capital. You are experiencing a Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having to say multi-platform broadcasts. And before I situate you with all the different mediums that we're on and give you an overview of the show, I do want to say hi to our dear friend, a Chicana literary icon and a, a literary icon of American letters, uh, Norma Cantu. I'm going to give you a fancy introduction later, and uh, we'll talk more about her her book. But first, I want to give her an audio uh, abrazo and let her say hi to us quickly because it's great to have her join us on the air to talk about one of her new works. Uh, Norma, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm um, so glad to be here. And yeah. of course, we are celebrating the publication of the new book, Chicana Portraits, Critical Biographies of 12 Chicana Writers. And this really is an important work because this will help place some of these really powerful writers in a context where scholars can 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 use the work easily and i've asked norman she's agreed to read from the introduction to the book she'll do that shortly but i do want to let you know how you're tuning in i do want to read from her biography and then i'm going to throw it to her to share from the introduction to to this new book i'm so happy that you're joining us on one of our different platforms perhaps you're tuning in on the Facebook live stream. So the show begins on the Facebook page for Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. We will actually edit the audio and then that will air on 90.1 FM KPFT, Houston's community station. That means this will be broadcast at 100,000 watts in the fourth largest city in America. And I do want to pause because if you are one of our listeners, we want to remind you that the only reason we can broadcast in a major city, in a major way, voices from our community, our terms and our terms, is because you empower us. And you do that by supporting the station, which in turn supports us. There's no commercials here. We don't have to worry about commercial enterprises demanding that their product be promoted, but we do count on you. So if you can make a donation in the name of Nuestra Palabra to KPFT, Please do so, and you can do, do so by going to kpft.org or calling 713-526-5738. And subsequently, a version of this will also become the Nuestra Palabra podcast so that you can tweet it, text it to community centers, students, and friends. That brings us to today's show. I'm really excited to get to talk to Norma about this book and Perhaps you're tuning in just in time to experience the launch of this book at the Latino Bookstore. So Norma will form part of the Texas Author Series at the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio. And of course, every second Friday of the month, you can expect a great event there. This will take place on the second Friday of October, October 13th. And the name of the book is Critical... Uh, biographies of 12 Chicano writers. You'll also be reading with John Olivares Espinosa, whose book, The Date Fruit Elegies, ha has come out, and he's also um, an award-winning poet. But I do that to let you know that once you hear about this book, you can get your hands on it in many platforms, but support your local bookstores. And I'm going to read in the voice of Norma, because this is from the uh, Trinity University website. Uh, born in Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, Eso! and raised in Laredo. Shout out to Laredo. Um, I'm going to say she is intimately bound to the U.S.-Mexico border region. As a scholar, she focuses on issues of borders and boundaries, whether in academic disciplines or the geopolitical borderlands of Mexico and the United States, all through a Chicana feminist theoretical lens. Uh, Norma writes poetry and prose, what Norma calls creative Otro bioethnography. And I think that's a huge genre, important genre that you've been cultivating. Uh, also with the focus on the borderlands and heavily, heavily rooted in the cultural traditions of the reading of the region. Uh, Norma's life formation as a working class Chicana 
shapes her intellectual and aesthetic endeavors and impels her to act to deconstruct the oppressive structures that exist in society. Norma passionately believes that words have power. And of course, on this show, we completely endorse that. And that literature has the potential to create the change we need. Perhaps that other, that's why there's forces at work trying to ban these works or limit access of our community to these works. She, she works with students to use the power of their stories and their words to create a better world for all sentient beings. Uh, that's beautiful, and I love that it is there on the uh, university website. Today we're talking about Chicana Portraits, Critical Biographies of 12 Chicana Writers. Norma, you were kind enough to agree to read from the introduction. The microphone is yours. Gracias, Tony. Y muy buenas tardes to everyone who's listening, watching. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. I begin by acknowledging uh, my ancestors, our ancestors, and those who were in these lands before we got here. Also, the incredible power that Nuestra Palabra exercises just by highlighting authors and words and books. Muchas gracias, Tony. So yeah, you asked me to read from the introduction and I thought I'd read from the beginning, but not the very first paragraph where I'm setting it up. Uh, I'm setting it up by situating us in Laredo, Texas, where the artist, Raquel Valle Sentias, and by the way, Tony, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, she will be at the October 13th event at the bookstore here in San Antonio, Raquel Valle Sentias, who did the, the portraits, the actual paintings. So I'll read from the second chapter. <clears throat> and I'm talking about being in a cafe that Raquel owned for a while. Our host, Raquel Valle Sentias herself, is, an, is active in the local literary scene. Her dream of owning a bookstore has come true, and it is all as she dreamed and what she hoped it would be. In the 1980s, Valle Sentias had begun writing poetry, taking art classes at Laredo Community College, now Laredo College, with Marta Fenstermaker. I was then a professor at Laredo State University, now Texas A&M International, and we, the literatontos, as some jokingly referred to us, were a handful who were keeping Chicanismo alive as we engaged with community projects that address the raging problems of the day. Immigration, illiteracy, erasure of our history, historic preservation, etc. By the 1990s, we had coalesced into a force engaged in important interventions, launching a chapter of Amnesty International to do our work in the migrant detention center run by the private carceral company, Corrections Corporation of America, and establishing the Refugee Assistance Council to provide legal services to migrants. It was the days of massive migration from Central America due to the U.S. incursions into that region of the Americas. Many of our members were also involved in the feminist group Las Mujeres, and we hosted an annual conference called Primavera to promote and recognize the accomplishments of women in our community. I discuss Las Mujeres below as I contextualize the work of Café del Barrio and Raquel Valle Sentíez's important role in our Laredo community. Now, um, in a little bit of historical context, I talk about that cultural life. Cultural life along the U.S.-Mexico borderlands is anything but the wasteland some have described. Many who do not live on the border see it as a cultural desert, devoid of any literary or artistic activity. In fact, it is rife with cultural events and home to a rich and vibrant population of cultural creators that includes poets, fiction writers, dramatists, painters, muralists, sculptors, and many traditional artists whose ephemeral art, such as piñatas and elaborately decorated cakes, and more permanent, like landscaping, quilting, wood carving, attest to the varied and deeply rooted aesthetics of the community. Border art and literature are often political and expressive of the sociocultural reality of those who live along the border. 
groups spring up and create spaces for art as well as for political undertakings. Such activity is not new. It has deep roots in the cultural life of the borderlands. The history of Laredo, indeed of South Texas, attests to that cultural activity amid the always contentious political drama that have played out in our community. From its beginning in the mid 18th century, 1755 to be exact, Laredo has grappled with class issues and the legacy of a colonialist mentality that exists in all sector of its social strata. A point that Elaine Pena makes in her 2020 book, Viva George, celebrating George Washington's birthday at the US-Mexico border. Yes. George Washington's birthday is the reason for the city's main and incongruous annual celebration. I think I'll stop there <laughs> on that introduction because what I do then, I talk about the Tlaxcaltecas who come to the area around the time that it is founded by the Spanish, but the in, including the indigenous who have been there way before mm -hmm. that. And because it is at a point on the river where it's pretty low sometimes and easily crossed, we have a lot of migrants coming through there. Uh, I talk about La Raza Party coming to Laredo, about the constant political activity that was there and the artivism, the artist activists in our community like Raquel and others. Uh, I also talk about Las Mujeres, which was a group that was around, mm -hmm. I wanna say 15 to 20 years. I'm not sure exactly how long, but it was pretty important uh, in, mm -hmm addressing issues like illiteracy. We started the Literacy Volunteers of Laredo. That's still going on 40 years wow. later. Wow. That's amazing, yeah. So uh, the introduction also has an interview with Raquel Valle Santillas about why she painted these portraits of Chicana artists. And I can tell you, for me, I was blown away when, I, when she told me this project. She painted Sandra Cisneros first and then she painted me <laughs> and I was going, what? And then she tells me, well, you know, in the 19th century, the earlier eras, artists would paint the writers or photographers would photograph the writers. Mm -hmm. So she says, nobody's doing that for Chicana, so I'm gonna do it. And she started painting and she ended up with 12 portraits altogether, wow. which is amazing. She had a couple of others that she didn't want included but the ones that she wanted included, in, and I insisted, included one of herself. Because Raquel is a playwright and a poet, and why not? <laughs> she's also an artist, so she she's in the book. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, I think and I think one of the, one of the important roles that this book will play is to archive, document some of that history but what I would love for readers and our audience to appreciate is that you are mixing many genres. Um, obviously, we as Libertaficantes and part of the Mas Tejas Foco uh, contingent have always been advocating for Mexican American studies. Sometimes that's perceived as history, and that's the formal discipline in the academic world. Um, sometimes it's imagined as Mexican American literature but here you are combining the quotidian life that we want to hear about these important movements that perhaps are not shared directly in other forms. And then I love too, that you've got the visual arts component and mixing all of that in a, in a very powerful direct way. So I do want to talk a little bit more about that in the overview, but I also would like you to tell folks, um, I want to remind folks that, Perhaps they've seen you read and they love how you engage with the audience. So they may forget. In ese momento, se olvidan que eres profesora, a scholar, an activist, and so many other things. Because that would ha that's what happens. Right now, I want to remind them that you are a leading intellectual in the country and a scholar. Can you tell our listeners and folks, why are critical biographies important in the world of academia? Why is it important for these Chicana writers to have those critical biographies? But I also feel like you're making this accessible to our community. Um, can you speak on some of that? Oh, of course, absolutely. 
And you are so right. Um, it's in a way the book is fulfilling a lot of different goals, including a pro giving us a history, a literary history of selected writers, not everybody, obviously, and selected female writers. We very consciously mm -hmm. focused on the women. And uh, for example, Angela de Hoyos, critical intervention here in San Antonio and for the Chicano Studies, Chicano Movement, because she and her husband, Moises, established the printing press. And so many authors were published first with Angela and Moises here in San Antonio at MA editions. I mean, writers like Max Martinez, uh, Yolanda Broiles Gonzalez was here for a while. She was publishing with them. And even Raquel, Raquel's, Raquel's a poet, like I said, and her first book, Soy Como Soy Que, was published by MA Editions. So it's a lot, also a literary history and a history of the movimiento, if you will. It mm. starts with, the book starts with Angela de Hoyos, ends with Demetria Martinez, because it's told chronologically. So it is a, a history, as it were. Uh, the role of the scholar, in my view, should not be this ivory tower distant from the messy world we live in, especially when we have such a need to look at how messy it is and what makes it so, and all the intersections of oppression that are there for our community. So the critic, the literary critic, has a dual role. Yes, mm -hmm. it's an intellectual pursuit, but it's also highlighting the life of that author mm -hmm. and how that life is intertwined with the community. And the 12 people that I chose, because pretty much I asked people <laughs> to write the critical biographies and all of them, no one said no of everybody I asked, no one said no. Wow. And all of them talk about the writing, talk about the life of the authors, and they talk about themselves in, in some way as intellectual activists, if you will. They don't call it that necessarily, but that's how I see them. Because in documenting the literature, in documenting the authors, what they're doing is becoming part of that history, of that literary history. So a critical biography is important. You asked why? Well, two things come to mind. One, it establishes the writer in the literary canon as an important writer. Although some of the people in here, I mean, come on, Sandra Cisneros, <laughs> they're already in the canon, right? But there's Montserrat Fontes, I think a really important border writer, born in Laredo, but is in California. Her novels about the border are, are treasures, and yet very few people know about her or Angela de Hoyos with her poetry. Mm -hmm. So it's also kind of uncovering or recovering some of the writers that have done the work, but remain kind of on the edge uh, in, 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 uh, in the shadows. So mm -hmm. that's what the literary biography, critical biography does. It analyzes the life and the work. I hope that answers your question. That does, and I really appreciate that perspective, especially for folks who may be tuning in and maybe are not in the academic world, but I also want them to understand that you've shaped this in a way that is very much something that someone at a community center or someone from outside academia can enjoy, but I don't want them to lose sight of the fact that this is another way to implement Mexican American studies in a way, uh, Chicano studies in a way. Um, and I want to remind our listeners that you are tuning in to one of the intellectual leaders of the country, a giant in American letters, Norma Cantu. And we are broadcasting this during prime time on KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston's community station in the fourth largest city in America at 100,000 watts, and we're not beholden to any corporate sponsor. We're beholden to the people. So right now, I want to remind folks that this can go away. We need your support. So if you can make a donation to KPFT in the name of Nuestra Palabra, Latino Writers Having to Say, please go to kpft.org or dial 
5265738. We are talking about a powerful, a powerful new book, Chicana Portraits, Critical Biographies of 12 Chicana Writers. And Norma is the editor of this, also in this, and she will form part of the Texas Author Series at the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio. And the big events are every second Friday of the month at the Latino Bookstore. This will be the second Friday of October, October 13th. And also reading that night will be John Olivares Espinosa, reading from the Date Fruit Elegies, and also complying with the requisites for his San Antonio Creative Writing Grant. Um, and I want people to know too, if you're watching this broadcast after the fact of the reading, don't be too sad. One, you're hearing about this great book anyway. Two, you can share this. And then the Latino bookstore will keep in stock signed copies of this amazing book. And I hope that people will then spread the word and take that next step in replenishing underground libraries, public libraries, and family libraries with this book. Uh, uh, nor oh, yeah. nor oh, yeah. I was no, just going to no, say, no. yeah, I was just going to say how important it is, I feel, that we know the authors, the Chicana authors. We may know Sandra Cisneros, but there's biography in here and the, and the, a little bit about each of the books. The same thing with Jen. Jen wrote the essay, by the way, on Carmen Tafoya, the first poet laureate in San Antonio. Uh, Carmen Tafoya, many of you know, has an incredible trajectory. She's such an activist and such an important writer in our community. Well, her portrait appears, and Jen, uh, she was amazing. She wrote the essay on her. So, yeah, and I also wanted to show, show you some of the images, if I may. Please, please. Because the painting, sorry, oh, here's Carmen's. And I don't know if you remember, some of you may recognize this photograph because you've seen it. Uh, it's Carmen, being Carmen, fabulous. And it's Demetria Martinez from New Mexico. Demetria is also a novelist and a poet, wonderful journalist. Uh, some of you may remember her work because she was in the 80s in, in mm -hmm. tribe for um, transporting undocumented uh, immigrants with a priest. And if you've ever heard her talk about the trauma, it was that her words, her poems were used against her. I mean, it's that could <laughs> kill the writing, but mm -hmm. she survived it and she's still writing. Uh, Sherry Moraga, there. <laughs> another powerful voice, another powerful story about being activist. Denise Chavez from Las Cruces. She, her, her essay is also amazing. It was written by Mariah Gomez, another Nuevo Mexicana. She got her PhD here in San Antonio at UTSA in English, and she's a professor at UNM in Albuquerque. Just amazing, both the writers of the biographies and of course the writers the biographies are about are just amazing people. Here's Montserrat Fontes. So, and the one that wrote Montserrat's biography is Mary Pat Brady, who's a professor at Cornell University. A wonderful scholar, feminist, I mean, all of these writers. So it's not necessarily academic. It's very accessible. Anybody can pick it up and learn. Okay, so you read House on Mango Street. Now read about Sandra. Mm -hmm. who she is, what else has she written? And so it's kind of fleshing out some of those questions you may have when you read a book. I, I want to remind I folks, to remind too, folks. several of these writers, Chicanas, were on the um, stellar Tucson Unified School District Chicano Studies, Chicana Studies um, curriculum that was banned by right-wing legislators in Arizona back in 2012. Um, of course, all of us united to to fight that. We were happy to become Libra Tapicantes and smuggle some of those books back. But I mention it because um, 
You know, Demetria Martinez is a dear friend of Nossa Palavra and the Libra Traficantes. Her books were among those. Um, as you mentioned before, she was attacked in, uh, in court for her words. Um, you know, you've got Gloria Anzaldúa in there as well. Sandra Cisneros, Carmen Tafoya. Denise Chavez is a dear friend of Nuestra Palabra and the Libre Traficantes. And we had a, we, the Libre Traficantes the caravan stopped there in Mesilla, Nuevo Mexico, where she has a bookstore out también. Um, so I mentioned all that because there's two things I want our listeners to appreciate. One, while we were helping our brothers and sisters in Tucson and uniting with folks from across the Southwest to defy that ban. I noticed that there were different lists of the banned books, but when um, Dr. Elaine Romero created the annotated bibliography of the banned books, that gave it a certain gravitas or credibility that all of a sudden other lists did not have and that people started using in classrooms. So I say that because people should understand that Chicanas accessing these elite forms helps spread it in different ways. The other thing, the other thing I would add as well is that I think what your work is doing here is reinstituting these voices into academia, high schools, where they were removed. We don't have time to talk about this. I would say not replaced sufficiently but here are these voices again, like you said, that can be studied overall. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, I have a question. Especially in Texas and here in San Antonio, that has immense this book, but the writers in the book, the authors, are also mm, voices that we need to hear. Voices that our students need to know about. And many of them write, obviously, from their experiences. I mean, Cherie Moraga writing her um, autobiographical work and her plays. It's reflecting a reality. And when we ban these books from the schools, when we don't have these voices in the schools, we're shortchanging our students. We're not allowing them access to their history. And of course, the one that everybody talks about, and especially in Arizona, is the success of Mexican American studies in that high school and how it added so much for the students to see themselves in the books, in the literature, in the history, and thereby gain self-confidence and succeed in school. It's it's a no-brainer. And I I can't imagine not wanting that to happen. Of course, the rationale that is used, and I'm now gonna get to something else. It's not in the book, but you know, the whole banning of books, even now in schools like in Fredericksburg, Texas, at the library or in some of the school districts that we hear about. Why is it, why is there fear of these voices coming into the classroom? I'm not, I don't get it. I just don't understand that. Or the, the attack with the Senate bill, what was it, 3979, the one on the critical race theory. It -hmm. just baffles me that somebody would want to curtail knowledge learning. It, it just doesn't make sense. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent here. But yeah, in a way, I think that the authors in this book, many of them ha- were banned. And in uh, not just in Arizona, but in some of these other books, other um, p- spaces. But they represent something really critical, and that is our knowledge, mm-hmm. who we are as a community, as Chicanas. Um, what we bring to the conversation. So, yeah, I, I really don't get me going on that because <laughs> I get all upset about how people, you know, I used to work a lot on literacy in Laredo. We started the Literacy Volunteers in Laredo. And for 40 years now, that organization has been there teaching people to read in English. 
And it amazes me how people don't read who know how to read. I mean, I understand that if you don't know how to read, right. But if you know how to read, you still don't. There's something wrong with that picture. And unfortunately, that happens more and more. And I want to remind folks that you're you're touching on some of the issues that we've dealt with here on the radio show and through live actions. Uh, Right now, I call it a a culture of censorship. You alluded to one of the laws here in Texas implemented to attack this imaginary critical race theory curriculum, which is not being taught in kindergarten. Um, but there's another one now, House Bill 900, that will, uh, it's been stopped by the courts as of this broadcast, um, but that's supposed to force books that sell, I'm sorry, bookstores that sell books to um, to schools to implement a graphic sexual rating system and putting all the work on bookstores as well as school libraries and if you think about it, um, I'm sure at some point there's going to be debates on, well, is holding hands sex- sexually graphic? Is, you know, Latinos kiss on the cheek. Is that kiss sexually graphic? Is staring in each other's eyes sexually graphic? And um, I was on a panel with uh, the president of the Texas ACLU, and she pointed out that in every slave narrative, there's a discussion of rape. Is that sexual uh, graphic material? Um, and And again, we've alluded to the past ban of, uh, Mexican market studies in Arizona, which was overturned. And I do want to mention, you mentioned what's going on in Fredericksburg. Shout out to Cristina Granados and folks over there trying to defy that, but also KDISD is making a lot of attention. And the last thing I'll say, um, Norma, because you're right, that's not the topic. We do address it. We must allude to it. Um, here in Houston, Texas, Houston Independent School District has been taken over by the state of Texas. And part of the move to increase the test scores of the schools in Houston is to take school libraries and turn them into detention centers uh, where students go to be punished. I'm going to stop there because that's topics for the shows. I don't want to depress people. You can defy all this by supporting public libraries, underground libraries, and family libraries. And one way you can do that is by getting a copy of Chicana Portraits getting it signed. The book is titled Chicana Portraits, Critical Biographies of 12 Chicana Writers. Get it signed. Make it a story. We hope that you will join us with uh, Norma Cantu at the Latino Bookstore. It's going to be the second Friday in October, and that is Friday, October 13th at the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio. Believe it or not, it's free, right? Um But what I want to encourage you to do is to help supplement other libraries, other readers, because this is such an important book that can form the basis for the beginning of a family library or a community center can begin to give classes to that extent. And wouldn't it be great for them to get a a classroom set of of the material? I want to bring it back to to the book itself, uh, Norma. If you can walk through it, too, because... I want people to understand that you've got a scholar from our community, because some of the names you've mentioned who wrote the pieces, I know them. I love it. I know Jen. She's awesome. Uh, We had, we celebrated her book of poems at the Latino bookstore. Um, She's writing about Carmen Tafoya, who I just saw, and she was at the Latino bookstore. Um, I, I love that. And now you've got the painting. So they're portraits. So this combines so many different disciplines. Mention a few of the other writers and how you came up with combining these things. And then also I'd love for you to read from, from your essay. The first person in the book is the uh, portraitist. The actually Raquel Valles-Santillas. And who, by the way, will be at the bookstore on October 13th. And her uh, essay, or the biography of her is dual. There are two people, Carlos Flores, who is a professor retired now from Laredo, and also a scholar from Spain, Maria Jesus Castro do Pasio. 
And each one of them took a different aspect of Raquel's life. So Carlos wrote about her as a person, as a writer, as a poet, as a dramatist, the way he knows her. And Maria Jesus wrote about her paintings, which are in here, and about other paintings. But it's really a kind of nice critical biography that includes two authors. And then Angela de Hoyos that I was talking about earlier, it's called A Poet Artivist. And this one, my friend Maria Esther Quintana, who is a professor at a and Spanish professor, and her student, Malena Maria Margarita Guerra de Charur, who is a journalist in Laredo, they got together to write one critical biography of Angela. And you'll discover all kinds of wonderful things about this incredible poet and an activist here in San Antonio from the 70s and 80s, actually starting in the 60s. But the other thing that Angela did that I think people forget is she offered a space for writers in her home. Whenever she was doing things, she always opened her heart and her publisher uh, husband, she and, and, and Moises were just incredible. And then Montserrat Fontes, Mary Pat Brady wrote that. Montserrat lives in California. She's an octogenarian. She's still active. She's not writing anymore, sadly. I asked her, why? Why did you stop writing? And she said, I think I've said everything I needed to say, which is an amazing statement. Uh, and Glenn, my lifelong mentor, if you will, although we were about the same age, Gloria Ansaldua. We're celebrating, by the way, the 20th anniversary of her passing in May uh, with a conference here in San Antonio, the Gloria Ansaldua, the study, the Society for the Study of Gloria Ansaldua is hosting a conference, El Mundo Surdo, at UTSA. And uh, the deadline has passed for proposals, but everyone's welcome to attend. And we will be going to the Valley. Her essay was by a former student of mine who is now a professor at Texas Tech University, Cordelia Barrera. And it's brilliant biography. I'm gonna encourage Cordelia to make it into a book length biography because it is really incisive and really gets to the core of Ansaldua's theories. And then there's one by of me that Gabriela Gutierrez Simuz, a professor at Seattle University, wrote lovingly. I, I just I'm really touched by that. I had, you know, trepidation. Should the editor get herself in the book? How does that work? I always try to stay away when I put together creative autobi I mean creative anthologies. Um, I don't include myself. It just feels like, mm, no. Nah. But in academia, in academic work, often the editor contributes an essay. So I was persuaded to include mine by the artist because she says it's one of her favorite paintings. So she wanted me to, to put it in here. I'll show it to you and you can you can decide if if it is <laughs> what she says it is. I'm not so sure, although a couple of people have told me it's their favorite retrato or cuadro, right? Uh, oh gosh, I can't find it now. Here it is. <laughs> ¿Qué les parece? And I don't, I'm not gonna take that post. <laughs> but Gabriela did a really good job of kind of putting together all of the work that I've done in the different areas, including folklore, and wrote about that. And then Carmen, Taf oh, no, then sigue Denise, Denise Chavez. And that one was written by Mariah Gomez. I think I mentioned that already. And then Carmen Tafoya with Jen Yanez Alaniz. And Cherie Morada, Cherie's piece is beautiful, uh, written by Lourdes Torres. Lourdes is a professor at DePaul University in Chicago and has written about Cherie elsewhere. So she was a natural to ask to, to contribute that biography. Ana Castillo is an amazing critical biography by a young, new Chicana scholar, May Megan Solomon, who is a brand new assistant professor in Georgetown at uh, the university there, here in Georgetown, Texas. And then Lorna, Lorna D. Cervantes, also incredible poet. And Elisa Rodriguez wrote that one. Elisa is also a professor. Uh, it's a really beautiful tribute to Lorna, the poet. It's a Yama, no self, 
but in other selves. I haven't been giving you the titles of the biographies. Uh, Sandra's is written by Georgina Guzman, and it is Sandra Cisneros, colon, rebel mentor for generations of hijas de la mala vida with a social consciousness. I think it's the longest title in, in the whole book, but it really captures um, Sandra's work and, as a mentor, but also as a writer, obviously, and her social consciousness. So it's it all ties it ties it all together. And finally, Cristina Herrera, who usually works with uh, children's literature, young adult literature. But she also has done work on Demetria Martinez. And so she wrote the critical biography of Demetria Martinez. And you said to read about mine. I'm not sure I want to read about mine. I'll treat you the title because it's very kind of witty. <laughs> it's normalizing. What is Chicanex? A life of beautiful norms in the interstice. <laughs> and I think Gabriela was having a lot of fun with playing with words to give it that title. Um, she's very generous with her analysis. And she talks about how other scholars have written about my work. And she, and she of course, focuses on probably the book everybody knows that I wrote, Canicula, Snapshots of a Girlhood in La Frontera. But then she also writes about Cabañuelas, and she writes about Meditación Fronteriza, my collection of poetry. Um, she quotes, she puts poems in here. I'll read a, a, one of the poems she includes an excerpt from. It's called Living in Dangerous Times. We live in dangerous times, times that call for dangerous measures, that call for witnessing and protesting like we did in 1911 when they were lynching us in South Texas, brown bodies hanging from trees, like we did in 1972 when they were killing us in the rice paddies of Vietnam and the highways of Aslan. And she includes that in her analysis because she's looking at how my poetry kind of speaks to what's going on in the world. Um, I don't know, it's just, I was very honored that she wrote those words and, and caught, you know, some, some writers or some readers just never get you. She got me, <laughs> she got what I was trying to say and what I was trying to do. I would say the same thing uh, on Gloria and Saldua, Cordelia Barrera's biography of her, a critical biography, captures what Ansaldua was doing in the 1980s and then subsequently with her other work, trying to capture that South Texas ganas, uh, the way that we in, in Texas speak, the way that we in South Texas deal with the world and with our history. So I think the authors, the critics are also incredibly important to recognize. And I, Tony, thank you so much for bringing um, books like this one to the attention of, of your audience, because it's not like a novel or a collection of poems. It's an anthology, an anthology of portraits, the paintings, but also portraits, the biographies. And I think um, I was speaking, I think, with Rodrigo earlier about how I, uh, I like to break genre molds and kind of break out of like either just one or another. So in other edited work that I have, I've also included photographs. I've also included paintings. There's one um, called Moctezuma's Table, and it's about Rolando Briseño's artwork, where I have essays about the work, but we also have the beautiful artwork. And then we have Liliana Wilson, an uh, artist here in, in Texas. Same thing, we have her biography and we have images, many images, 60 some, but also essays by art critics and scholars and, and people who know her and love her, including Nasaldua. So I'm, I'm saying that in this book, again, I break with some of the rules and do something different. The um, authors, 
are listed here, the, the others that are being highlighted. And in the back, we have the, the critics who are writing the, the biographies because both make up the whole. You can't have one with the other. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I went off on, on a tangent. Not at all. That, that was brilliant. I appreciate you being so generous with your brilliance. And I want to I wanna tell folks that you are a world-class writer. So I do appreciate you creating this work where you're launching careers of some scholars. You are cementing the careers of others. And that takes time from your writing of your I'm going to call it just fine arts for lack of a, of a better word. So to me, I appreciate that very much. And I'm very glad that you are included in this because to me, our community always wonders, well, is it stepping out of line or is it, is it being um, taken, uh, abusing the, the power I have in this? I don't want you to be punished <laughs> for your expertise and there's so few of us that have access to be able to, to do this sort of work that that makes you part of the work too. So, um, so by all means, it is important that you're in this book for all that you do. And I think it's also uh, wonderful that you've made it so, so artistic as well. So, uh, Thank you so much, Nomer, for joining, Nomer, us. For joining us. I want to give another, to give another shout out, to, shout the book. out to the book. We are celebrating, we are celebrating Chicana, Chicana portraits, portraits, critical biographies of 12 Chicana writers. And you can also get your signed copies by uh, visiting the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio. And Norma will form part of the Texas Authors Series, which takes place every second Friday of the month in 2023. And in October, that is on Friday, October 13th. And you mentioned there'll be some of the contributors and artists from that book as well. So thank you so much. Uh, any, any parting words, Norma? Pues nada, just thank you again con the todo corazón. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk about the book. And thank you for the work you do. Uh, Saldua said that we must do work that matters. Vale la pena. And I guess in response to your comment about how I could be writing my own books, right, instead of putting together these anthologies. But in a way, I see that as my life's work to highlight other writers as well, to bring others up along with me and to make them known to audiences that may not know them. And so, yeah, and this is an intergenerational book. As you noted, there's brand new Dr. Uh, Solomon who just got her PhD and then some established authors and critics like Mary Pat Brady and some others. So yeah, it's, I have no regrets about doing any of it. Al contrario, I wish I had more time to do more of it and it's, Part of my life's work, it's my mission for being on this earth to do the work, the work that matters, to do the writing, definitely, and to share that writing in whatever way I can, like tonight with your audience. And uh, whenever, I, either through the live, um, Facebook Live, or Nuestra Palabra, or on October 13th at the bookstore. It's just part of the, of the way, reason that I do what I do. So muchísimas gracias. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for all the cariño and for being so generous with your brilliance. Uh, speaking of being generous with their brilliance, I do want to thank part of the Nuestra Palabra team. It's a huge team. Uh, I want to thank Rodrigo Bravo Jr., who is our sound engineer and does so much for Nuestra Palabra. Also, Roxana Guzman, who's our multi-platform uh, producer. And Liana Lopez, Brian Paras, Lupe Mendez, Laura Costa, who were also co-founders of Libertad Ficante, but are also part of our leadership team. And then also Mark Anthony Pignon, Mark Sedgwick. Uh, we got Carolina del Carmen, Lisa Tencio, and so many others uh, who are helping 
to get the word out in different ways, shape, or form. And I want to thank all of our listeners on 90.1 FM KPFT. One last call. This was a fantastic show. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'd like to hear more shows like this from now into the future. And you can assure that by making the donation to KPFT in the name of Nuestra Palabra. And you can visit kpft.org or call 713-526-5738. I'm Tony Diaz, the Libre Traficante, and we look forward to seeing you behind the book. Thank you. Buenas noches.